Greetings and welcome to the Smithsonian Education Online Conference. My name is Jonathan and I'm happy to be your host today to help guide us through the session for a, a jam-packed hour, meeting some incredible experts who are going to help you better understand how you too can become an expert in astrophotography. We're going to be doing it yourself, astrophotography today, applications for the classroom and beyond. Um, very uh, delighted to welcome you. I wanted to give you a sense as to how you could best interact with us today because this session is coming to you live from the Smithsonian. Um, first thing you can do is let us know a little bit about yourself. If you haven't already in the online forum on the Smithsonian Education Online Conference site, if you go ahead right now and jump in the chat area on the left side of the screen, you'll see a space at the bottom where you can enter in a little bit about who you are or where you're joining us from today. And then uh, Go ahead and hit the enter key on your keyboard or that little chat bubble in the corner and uh, we'll see your message appear here on our side so we can get to know you a bit. By the way, it is possible that during the course of the event you have some technical questions that aren't about astrophotography and they're about the webcast instead. And if that's the case, you can either enter those questions in the chat box or you are most welcome to write to smithsonian at learningtimes.com and we will uh, respond to you as quickly as possible. Excellent. And I'm already starting to see some uh, people introducing themselves from uh, from far and wide, so thank you very much. Keep those coming in. Uh, I did want to point out that we are closed captioning the event today. Uh, if you are seeing the captions appearing on your screen and you wish to continue to see those captions appearing, no need to do anything. Uh, if for any reason you'd like to turn them off at any time, uh, you can simply choose the menu on the right side where it currently says WGBH, who are our captioners today, and you can change that menu option to no captions, and that will turn the captioning off. You can always turn them back on again if you wish uh, to uh, see them. And uh, By the way, welcome Mary from Montana. Good to see you here. And, and uh, David up in Boston and, uh, and so many others who are introducing themselves. Excellent. Uh, don't forget as well that the Twitter hashtag for our experience, for those of you who are tweeting, is astrophotography. Uh, and we do encourage you to use that. In a few moments, I'm going to turn the floor over to Mary, who's going to say a little bit more about badges. Uh, but as a participant in today's event, you should know that you will be receiving an astrophotography badge for your participation in the conference. But you'll learn more about some other opportunities to engage with Smithsonian content and, and, and opportunities in just a moment. Okay, well with that, I'm actually going to go ahead and turn the floor over to Mary DeSalt from the Smithsonian Astrophysical Obser Observatory, excuse me, to say a little bit more uh, about the prior session and the uh, badging opportunities. Great, thanks Jonathan, uh, and welcome everyone. It's uh, great to be with you virtually. Um, this session today is actually the second in what will actually be a series of three online conferences this summer featuring astrophotography. Last month, uh, perhaps some of you attended this session called Understanding Astrophotography, um, where science and art meet. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll give a little recap of that session in a moment. Um, but there were a, quite a lot of people attending, and in fact, uh, one of the things that's um, kind of nice is that sometimes people send in photos of themselves. We like to know that uh, there are people out there participating. Here's a picture of Cayush Elementary students. Um, so if you have any pictures, if you have a group there participating, we'd love to see a photo. You can send it to learning at si.edu. Um, these sessions have, as Jonathan mentioned, a digital badge opportunity associated with them. It's the Astrophotographer Badge, and there are three quests associated with that badge. Uh, take an image, enhance it, analyze, compare, and share. And um, those quests are uh, you can register for at smithsonianquests.org. Uh, here actually is a submission from the last conference uh, of um, a, a student's image of the moon that they took using microobservatory, and you'll hear more about how that works in a moment. Um, so your students uh, uh, 
uh, students can get feedback from Smithsonian educators as they pursue those badges. And there are additional supplementary resources uh, as well to help students accomplish uh, these badge quests. I just want to mention that next up after this uh, conference today, next um, month, the, there'll be a conference called NASA's Amazing Space using Hubble Space Telescope images in the classroom. And this is uh, the result of a collaboration between the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, where I work, and the um, Space Telescope Science Institute. So we'll hope to see you there as well. Um, I think Jonathan already noted some of the social networking opportunities, but if you are uh, uh, tweeting, you can tweet at smithsonian.edu. And our microobservatory team, actually, back at the Astrophysical Observatory, is at microobs. And the Astrophysical Observatory is at SAO Astro. And we'll be hearing later from Lindsay Bartholomew, who's uh, works at one of the Smithsonian affiliate museums called Miami at Miami Science Museum, and they have uh, ways to engage with them as well. All right. Well, so today's session, um, applications for the classroom and beyond. Uh, I'm going to just give a little recap from last week, and then uh, uh, introduce um, Lindsay. The last time we heard from Joe De Pasquale, who's actually the Ch Chandra science imager, he takes the raw data from the Chandra X-ray uh, Space Observatory, and using image processing software tools, he transforms that raw data that, when it comes in, looks uh, uh, not as aesthetically pleasing as the gorgeous press release images that you see coming from uh, these NASA observatories. And uh, so we learned about how he uses science and art to transform those images um, into something pretty special. And then at the last part of last week's session, I introduced the microobservatory online telescopes, which are um, operated and maintained uh, at the by the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, um, and which you can control over the internet. And we, um, I see we're asking here if any of you have used them yet, and a few have, so that's very exciting. And I encourage all of you uh, out there to try. We'll give you a little recap of um, how that works. Um, the telescopes have no human in the loop. You can control them over the web. There's a um, interface at microobservatory.org. And uh, all you need is the convenience of your laptop. Or actually, you can even use, if you have a smartphone, you can even control them from that. Uh, the web portal to control the telescopes, microobservatory.org, um, has there's several different portals there, and the one that is um, most intuitive and available to anyone with an email address is called Observing with NASA, because it was funded by NASA, not that you'll be using NASA telescopes. Um, you'll be using these uh, little three-foot robots, and you get to control the field of view, the exposure time, and a filter for those telescopes. And we went over that last conference. We, so if you want to learn more about that, I do encourage you to view the archive. Uh, and also at that website, there are plenty of tutorials about how to do that. Finally, last time, we learned about some specialized image processing software that is freely downloadable also at the Microobservatory website. And it makes it easy to enhance microobservatory images and also to do some other things that we'll be talking about more today. Since the last time, however, um, our next guest has uh, actually been using the telescopes with young audiences. And um, I, we thought first uh, it would be really interesting to have some case studies of how young people have been using the telescopes 
uh, before we tell you a little bit more about some of their other features. So, um, Lindsay, tell us what you've been doing. Oh, well, hello, everybody. We at the Miami Science Museum have been having a heyday with this program. We've done it twice now through both rounds of, of um, some mini grant opportunities, uh, once last fall and once this past spring. And we have involved um, some students who are participating in our museum programs, but I want to go through some things that we did in our program that hopefully you all can apply at your uh, respective uh, schools and museums and, and after school, wherever, wherever your opportunities are. So um, the way I structured the program, it's very, very adjustable. Uh, but the way I structured the program at, at the museum is a three-day sequence because the first day is really all about learning how to use the, the software. You don't have your own images yet, but there are images from the database, from the microobservatory database, um, that you can kind of practice with. So the students that I had in the program, um, by the way, the pictures that you see throughout these are all, all taken and processed from uh, students at the Miami Science Museum, and they're all fantastic. Um, How so, old are the students, by the way, that you're mostly working with? Uh, these students for the first round were high school students. When we went through the second round, which I'll talk about in a minute, we had a broader range, which included some young visitors and some families at the museum. Uh, but the, the first day, they, they experimented with, with the process. They got some practice in. And I also had some hands-on activities as well to kind of um, make it a little computer and hands-on based kind of program. I'll talk more about those uh, in a minute. At the end of the day, after they had the practice, they chose their own images that they wanted to request of the telescope so that when they came back on day two, they had their very own images emailed to them that they could then process uh, with the telescope. And, and again, the way I had it structured uh, for our program was with this day three kind of presentation day. So on day two, we took those activities from day one and had some practice time with them. The students kind of practice leading those activities for each other so that on day three, when we had their work printed um, up in the on, a, on the wall, they were able to kind of show off what they've done and lead the activities for, for other students and other people. I think one of the, the main things that I found really fun in watching the students participating in these programs is that is this connection between science and, and art and creativity. And a lot of, especially kids, they don't see that science really has a lot of creative and, and artistic aspects to it. And in this program, they, there's a lot of places to connect a lot of different kinds of content. We talked about different astronomical objects. You, know, you can uh, observe planets, nebula, galaxies, and you learn a little bit about those objects, how far they are, what their structure is, and then how do you see it? We talked about telescopes, optics, mirrors and lenses. Um, so now you have your image. What else can you learn about it? We talked about the nature of light, uh, color, wavelength, filters. Um, and then you even get to teach them a little bit or remind them a little bit of some other science and, and math without them knowing that they're doing some math um, to, uh, in their processing of the images because they actually get to experiment with what the images look like, linear versus log scale, stacking some images with red, green, and blue images to see that those colors add up to a full color image. And they take all these learning opportunities into a program that has complete creative freedom. And the students are used to, to programs where there's instructions and there's directions. And with this, they're able to use these, use the telescopes and use the software with complete creative freedom. And they invariably end up creating something that, that you've never seen before, which is one of the greatest things. Um, and then depending on how you run your program, there's a lot of other things that you can incorporate into it, um, like practicing presentation skills and, you know, and researching a caption. Have the students research a little bit of information about their object to make a caption for their display that you might put up in your hall or your bulletin board. Lindsay, a yes. quick question. Um, as a first-hand observer of people using the micro-observatory, mm -hmm. um, is it just me or is everybody as wowed by the fact that they're sitting in front of a computer 
receiving and controlling and sending instructions to uh, a, a remote device that's taking pictures of, of outer space. Is it is it as cool to everyone else as it is to me? I yeah. The, in my experience, yes. The the students, they, especially it, like I said, I had high school students in this first round, and they can be high school students in their own way. They're very hard to impress sometimes, and you tell them the word real, and they get to do it, and all of a sudden th their eyes get wide, and then you have to shove them out of the room at the end of the time because they they won't leave. They want to do more. And so that was one of the coolest things for, for our program. Um, one student, um, I've told Mary this story, one student asked me at the end of, of the day one of this first round, he asked, can I do this at home? And I said, yes. And he said, I think you just turned me on to something here. And he was very excited. So that was that was a great moment. That's almost like uh, for the, me. Uh, the robot followed me home. Can I keep him? Exactly. <laughs> uh, so this is what, at, at the Miami Science Museum, this is what our final uh, display looked like. Um, just to give you an idea of what, what we created, we wanted to give, and the students as well, wanted to give the visitors to our museum the idea of what they started with, not just what they ended with, but what they started with so that people could see that they really did, some, in some cases, start out with what appeared to be a, a black or blank image. And they ended up processing this, using this software to create this amazing you know, piece of scientific artwork. And they all created their own captions as well. Um, and on that last day, some of those activities that I mentioned that we practiced the first two days, we had students, as I said, lead them for other visiting students or other visitors to the museum. So we had a, at the top left, you see a laser maze where we basically had a, a laser and a, and a target and, and a set of mirrors for people to experiment um, with, uh, with light and reflection. Uh, we had some diffraction glasses where we talked about the nature of light, how light is made up of all the colors, white light. And then we had different color filters, images of um, nebula and galaxies and, and other objects from our cosmos, and had students uh, look at those and predict what they might see through the, the different color filters, as well as looking through everyday objects. You can see someone seeing what a blue cup might look like through a filter in that bottom right image. But there's lots of opportunities to connect this to lots of different kinds of, of science content. So we have a poll here. We wanted to test you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one of the um, activities that we did in our original workshop where we, the Smithsonian affiliates, were learning how to use this, um, the original one that Mary taught us. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the picture at the top there is a series of pictures of a sunflower. Those three black and white images, even though they're printed in black and white, were actually taken through a red, green, and blue filter. and Given the, the idea that a filter, the, a blue filter, for example, lets through blue light and it stops everything else. So I think everyone got the right answer so far. Oops, sorry. I gave the right answer too quickly. <laughs> <laughs> That's OK. We haven't, we haven't uh, displayed, displayed the results Oh, we the haven't results. displayed it for yes. anyone else. OK, so well, I see a lot of people giving the correct answer so far. So we'll just go ahead and let you see how you compare to your peers' answers. Okay. Most people think it's image one. Yeah, and most people would be correct. And and just to give everybody an idea, if if you if you guessed one of the other two images, you can see in that picture how the blue in that image is very bright, and the rest of the colors appear dark, and that was the, that was the clue. Um, so now using that knowledge, let's see if we can look at the real image of the the Trifid Nebula down there. Same kind of idea. Which one of these black and white images was taken through the red filter. Let's see what everyone thinks. We have another poll up. Oh, this one has more of a widespread, a little bit more difficult. The answers are in flux. But yes, the answers keep changing. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and, and uh, demystify this one. Uh, yeah, it looks like with more people responding, we have kind of the majority on the uh, correct answer, which is the top right one. 
you can kind of see where the red is the brightest in the color image, and that's where we really wanted to look at the, the black and white image that had that kind of matching feature as the brightest feature. So that's just an example of, of some of the things that you can experiment with um, in a hands-on kind of way in addition to the computer um, processing aspect. So one other thing I wanted to, to mention was that you probably have more resources at your uh, disposal than you than you may or may not have uh, considered. Um, in addition to the, the a computer lab or computers, um, local and university astronomy clubs are going to have lots of ideas. They're going to loan you um, maybe some, some materials. They're going to know what's happening in the night sky right now. They're going to be willing to come speak. This is my experience anyway. They're very excited about astronomy and they want to share it. So um, it's, it's a really good um, way to engage the community and then also let students hear from, from people who really know a lot about it. And, and take advantage of your own schedule. You have after school clubs or, or parent events or camps at your respective schools or institutions that um, would be great to showcase what the students have done. And I think I can speak for Mary and I that talk to the Smithsonian or your local science museum or the Miami Science Museum <laughs> and, and ask questions about you know what we've done in our experience in it in this program. So uh, we were excited to take advantage of round two when the Smithsonian offered um, a round two mini grant for this. And so again, these are pictures that our students took at the Miami Science Museum. So we wanted to take this opportunity to expand a little bit the program. So we did a few other things. We let the, the students, um, or we encouraged them to try some animation activities within the software. Those three orange-red images you see at the bottom was a student making kind of a psychedelic uh, meteor pass, pass by. You can kind of see that meteor in those pictures. And he basically created an animated meteor. And another thing that I did was give the students and the visitors who we had in our computer lab at the museum a little five-minute tutorial. It works on Mac or a PC, whether it's iMovie or Movie Maker. A little five-minute how to add sound effects, how to add captions, how to make cool animation transition effects, and challenge them to create a 30-second video with captions and sound effects explaining what they did in the program. And it was awesome and hilarious and amazing results that I think we're going to show you a couple examples here. Did you want to show another?
Lindsay, so. these, these are uh, amazing. Uh, you, you put the S, the T, and the E, and the M in STEM with these, and probably the A for STEAM and arts as well. This really covered the, the yeah, gamut I, of of, uh, of learning for these students. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, and when, when a student writes something like mind equals blown, that's, <laughs> that's the, the best compliment, I think. Um, and, and one other thing I wanted to note was that um, the, the students kind of initiated some other um, fun applications, and I thought of an, another one as well that we could incorporate into our other programming in Miami. Um, the top left image, you can see there, a student just took it upon himself. He mixed an image of the Whirlpool Galaxy that you can see there with a mountaintop image of Pitt Peak Observatory. You can see those bright things are actually the telescope domes. Um, and the, the bottom image, the bottom two images, are um, from an event that we had at the Miami Science Museum. You know, it's hurricane country, and it's also hurricane season now. And so we actually took hurricane images and input them into the same software to experiment with how we could take aerial satellite images from hurricanes and use the, the software to really analyze and animate the, the structure and detail of the storm itself, which was, which was very cool to try something else. And I think at the end of the day, it's the real thing. And I think those students that you see on the right there would never have thought that they could personally operate that telescope on the left to create a real thing that they could showcase their work that they're standing in front of there. So. We've had a great time with it, and we're looking forward to doing it more at the museum. It's fantastic uh, work, and you're getting um, you're getting a great response among uh, the, our colleagues who are logged in with us today. By the way, if you have questions for Lindsay about uh, the implementation of the program, uh, any tips or guidance, since we hope many or all of you will try out the micro observatory in your own uh, classrooms, uh, certainly is a great time to ask Lindsay for uh, any questions, big or small, that you might have. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, well, we'll go ahead and we'll return to questions. We'll have uh, some time as well after Mary speaks. Um, so we're going to go back now to Mary DeSalt to. Uh, I, I almost wanted to say to sort of zoom yeah. in on on some on some of the implementation details, but in a way, it's zooming out or up, <laughs> I should say. Right. We're going to zoom in and out at the same time here. Um, yeah, I want I want to uh, talk a little bit about some of the characteristics of the telescope um, and some of the things that can be done with it uh, in addition to uh, things that Lindsay has mentioned. Um, and also kind of give uh, folks out there motivation to try it yourself if you haven't tried it yet. And the first motivation, I think, is um, the one that means the most to me, which is uh, uh, that the sky belongs to everyone. And uh, these days, I know I live uh, in Boston, and I don't get to see very much of it, um, you know. Uh, but the nice thing about having a telescope of your own online that you can use at any time is that you start to develop a relationship with the sky that I imagine uh, people have always had um, uh, in the past, and so it's it's kind of neat to develop that relationship through technology. Um, and now. The microobservatory telescopes are small telescopes. They're just little six-inch telescopes. And um, uh, you might say, but there's all these incredible images from Hubble coming uh, that we see in magazines every day. Um, why should I use a small telescope when I can get access to the best telescopes in the world in uh, those images um, online? And my answer to that is the, for the same reason that if you, uh, if you go to the Grand Canyon, there's gorgeous images uh, that f professional photographers have taken of the Grand Canyon, but you want to take one yourself. Uh, and that ownership the, of taking an image yourself has so much more meaning and tells you so much more about the object being pictured. You have a connection to it, a personal connection. There's details of the way you took the photo that give it much more meaning than the photo that somebody else took. So um, I, I think that's really true of these images as well. Um, 
Now, uh, Lindsay um, highlighted a little filter puzzle uh, using the red, green, blue filters. And there is a curriculum available to go with the telescopes and activities. Um, one set of curriculum is available at this website. Uh, the Center for Astrophysics is what CFA is. That's where I work. So it's the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Um, and that uh, these um, curriculum activities are downloadable, and they uh, ha have lots of ideas for helping students learn about light and color, size and scale. Um, and uh, there are teacher and student guides as well. There are also activities available at that microobservatory.org site, at the Observing uh, with NASA portal, um, as you navigate through the site. In addition to being able to control the telescopes, you'll see that there's pages of projects and activities. And there's video tutorials and training. And then the software that Lindsay is talking about um, is specialized in that the images that come back from the telescopes um, are actually special astronomical format images and um, require some uh, special imaging, image editing software. And that's free and downloadable, was, was uh, created at um, the Center for Astrophysics. So uh, you can download it freely, and it, uh, won't, it's available for PC and Mac. Um, so, so here's some characteristics of the images I want to talk about that is not true of astronomical images you might see in textbooks or in magazines. Because all the microobservatory telescopes are identical, all the images that come from them are at the same scale. And it turns out that's really helpful into, for learning some things about uh, objects in space. And here on the left, you see a globular cluster. It's this huge cluster of hundreds of thousands of stars. And it's halfway across our galaxy. Um, uh, and really, in the field of view, although I've cropped it down, but it's, 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 I've, it's, you can see that it's almost as big as the moon, even though it's 25,000 light years away. Now, I'll mention, for those of you who um, want to know, a light year is 6 trillion miles. So that globular cluster is 25,000 times 6 trillion. I can't do the math that fast, miles away. Um, and uh, so, and yet it still appears as big as the moon. Uh, so it must be much bigger than the moon. There's actually a third object in this picture. I'm wondering if anyone has caught it yet. Uh, if you have, you might type in the chat box if you've seen the third object pictured on this slide. Um, let's see if anyone can identify it. Feel let's free to type in the chat. Yeah. Um, somebody. I'm, I'm allowing yeah. some wait time here to see yeah. if anyone can find the third object besides the moon and the globular cluster. We have a, a couple of responses coming in here. Um, the first among them was from Bill, who suggested perhaps it was Saturn. Yes. Uh, and David noted it as well. Excellent. Yes, this little thing right here uh, is actually Saturn, as imaged by the microobservatory telescopes. And um, a lot of uh, young people, the, sometimes the first thing they go to image is Saturn, because they want to see Saturn with its rings. Uh, and of course, those gorgeous images that you see in magazines were taken by a space probe that has gone all the way to Saturn to take the picture. Um, and one, you, can, you can definitely. Um, realize that even even though you we know Saturn is a much bigger planet than the moon this I image the way it compares in a s image taken at the same scale tells you it's much farther away than the moon um, and in fact you can actually use that fact to make measurements from microobservatory so that's another um, feature here for example are now this is going to be a little tricky bit of a um, question here. Here are a number of images. Before you don't put the poll up quite yet, Jonathan. Um, 
these are all taken at the same scale by uh, micro observatory. So they're all in a field of view that's about one degree. If you hold up your pinky at arm's length, your pinky fingernail is about the portion of the sky you're looking at for each of these images. Um, and so I want to have Jonathan put up a poll and see if you, there's no reason you should know this, but I want to see if you can guess um, the order of these objects from closest to farthest from Earth. And we'll see what uh, people think. And we'll give a little wait time here. It's a little tricky, so it may take you kind of have to look at the look at the picture and look at the options and figure it out. Um, and, uh, and of course, a couple things you can notice right away is, okay, everyone knows um, the moon should be, right, closer to the Earth than the sun. Why is the sun the same exact size as the moon? Well, we know that's the reason, even though we know the sun is much bigger than the moon in real, you know, in, if you took a tape measure to it. And um, the fact that it's so far away makes it appear the same uh, um, size. And you can see why we get eclipses by looking at this image. So let's reveal the, um, the, uh, the actual order here is uh, number four, moon, sun, Jupiter, the Orion Nebula, the Hercules Cluster, the Andromeda Galaxy, and then the Whirlpool. And among our respondents, there was um, one of the things you have to know, which there's no reason you should know if you haven't started studying astronomy, is that uh, nebulas are big clouds of gas and dust. Um, and for them to appear this big in microobservatory, they're within our own galaxy. Whereas the Andromeda galaxy is way beyond our own galaxy, another galaxy entirely. And um, the neat thing about this is that the Andromeda galaxy is actually quite big in the sky. It's bigger than the full moon, um, but it's quite dim. So you need dark skies or a camera that collects light over time to see it. Um, all right, so that's the kind of activity um, uh, the kind of sense making you can do with micro observatory images. One thing I really like to point out is that the that um, because they were taken with a digital detector that is um, uh, responsive to the amount of light that hits each pixels, the images are more than just pretty pictures. They're actually data. And I want to talk a little bit about um, what that means for your uh, working with students. Here, um, here's an example. The the little picture on the upper right there is a is a uh, digital CCD, a charge coupled device. They're called these days. Everyone has them in their phones, um, but in fact, this technology was originally developed in uh, astronomical applications and. Uh, any CCD is basically an electronic chip that has an array of pixels. And here's a, here's a diagram of a really simple chip. It's only got 10 by 10, 100 pixels. You would never want a 100 pixel camera, right? These days, it's all megapixels and gigapixels, but here. And imagine that, um, so this is the kind of data that's actually coming back from the telescope. It's numerical. It's telling at each section of the chip, it's giving a number that's directly related to the amount of light that fell on that pixel. So in this image, you can see that there's a couple spots. This is a this is a this is a detector that's not very responsive. It only goes from zero to eight um, in terms of brightness. But here's a couple of spots on the image where uh, there's a lot of light. Here's a bunch of spots where there's very little light hitting the detector, and Oh, look, here's 
some spots where there's a lot of light hitting as well. So if we, if we now use an image processing tool, like this one over uh, uh, to assign colors so that anything at an 8 value is white, anything at a 1 value is black, and other numbers are in between. Can anybody, has anybody seen the pattern that's in this detector? Can anyone tell us in a, a single word what you might see by looking at these numbers and trying to Let me see, there's a bright spot here image. with a little brightness around it. And we're gonna, I'm going to go to the next here. <laughs> yeah, Bill got it just in time. Oh, yeah, okay. So uh, if I go back, you again, images are just visualizations of the numerical data, and that's one of the reasons why you can add images together. You can add a red, green, and blue images is because you're at you're really adding numbers, um, and that's what uh, uh, astrophotography is about. It's really a mathematical. Uh, manipulation that you're doing with images. So I'm going to quote Lindsay's student and say mind equals blown on that one. That's actually a really that's a fascinating way to think of images as, as numbers. Right. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so here is a um, image of the moon taken um, with uh, micro observatory and it's uh, this is also an image of the um, uh, image processing um, software and you can see that um, I'm going to zoom in in the next image on this spot right here this crater and if I zoom in and zoom in on that you can start to see the individual pixels and how each one of them in this up here in the right has a pixel value uh, and that is really telling you how bright it is um, well, so the last few things I want to show you are some amazing things you can do with the fact that you can use the telescope to observe objects over time. And, um, and it turns out that the first astrophotographer really didn't have a camera, but had his sketchbook, and that was Galileo. And this is an image of Galileo's sketchbook. This is from 16... Well, this particular page might be from 1610, although the first time he looked through the telescope was 1609. Um, and uh, this was the first time anyone realized there were these craters on the moon. Um, so now your students can have the tools to observe those craters over time. And I actually want to show you the, the image processing software has an animation tool. So you can, add, you can load in multiple images taken on separate occasions, let's say day after day after day. And before you play this, oh, 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 oh can we stop it? Yep. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, before you play this, Jonathan, I want, I want people to really look closely at this um, animation of moon, of the moon and type in the chat box as you notice things. So make observations or questions that come to you as you watch this animation. Excellent. Okay, everybody ready? Here we go. Here we go. And it'll go a few times, so uh, as you notice anything just type it in, and really, any just just observe, you just just what you see. I like to train uh, students who are using telescopes for the first time not to try and interpret, but just just say what they see. Just observe. That the moon seems to be rotating. Yes, so that's an, an there's there's this. Um, unusual thing happening where it's rocking back and forth over the month. Has anybody noticed anything about the size of the moon? Let me see. Oh, right there. 
looks like it's actually getting a little bigger. And that is actually a real effect. The moon's orbit is not um, perfectly circular around the Earth. So during a month, as it goes around the Earth and goes through these phases, you can actually see the changing size, the changing diameter. And you can measure that and actually get an estimate for how uncircular the moon's orbit is. So there's a lot of math that you can do using these images. Um, and there are probably some other things you can notice as well. That rocking is a little bit um, like the, uh, is, is related to the relative position of the telescope and the moon at each stage. And it turns out that it's, it's actually a complicated physical model for me to convey doing this, but it's, uh, I'll leave that as a exercise for the, for, for the person who does it. Um, all right, a couple more animations. I think we just have a little bit of time left. Um, and uh, yet another um, Galilean discovery. Uh, Galileo trained his telescope on Jupiter. And uh, this um, image, can people see that image at the top, this drawing of um, Galileo? As you can see that he saw these little dots to the left and right of Jupiter. And they changed position over time. And this was, this was incredible 400 years ago because it suggested that the Earth was not the center of the universe, that other bodies had things going around them. Uh, and your students can make that discovery for themselves. Here's an animation of Jupiter over several, uh, um, several hours, I think this is. You can see those little moons moving. And I want to, um, I, I, I should uh, help people understand this giant vertical stripe uh, through that image is actually an artifact of the fact that in order to s ca capture enough light in the telescope to see the dim moons, you have to overexpose Jupiter. And, and remember those pixels are little digital um, elements on that detector. And when you overexpose one pixel, the, the electron, the, the elect, electric charge of the charge coupled detector spills over, and that's what that big spike is. So there's Jupiter over time. Uh, Galileo also observed Venus over time, in which you can do the same. Take images of Venus between now and December, and you will see the evidence that Venus is going around the sun. In the, it has phases, um, and that was an incredible discovery as well. Speaking of Venus discoveries, I, 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 this is um, an image we a series of images we took last June, June 6, 2012, of the Venus transit, and um, those are in the archive. Again, I think. Um, in the chat earlier, you could see that there, many of the images that are taken are available in the archive. And these are all available. Um, so you can try this yourself to make this animation. But let's play it now. And again, I want you to observe very closely um, and see if you the, uh, see what happens here. So this is over a period of about four hours. And you see Venus passing in front of the sun, as it did last June. And then it got to the end of the day. <laughs> and you can see the sun setting. And in fact, the nice thing I like about this animation is that you actually see, um, you see the way that the sun squashes as it's getting lower in the horizon because it's, the light is being refracted. So right about here, I think the sun starts getting squashed. And that's a real effect that you see with your eye, of course, as well. Um, and the other thing that was in that image were sunspots, which Galileo also observed, and uh, um, but which you don't want to observe in the same way that Galileo did, um, because in fact he actually 
hurt his eyes um, looking at these, but he noticed that there were these spots on the sun and that they shifted over time. Again, uh, we have a special solar filter and you can request images of the sun. Uh, it turns out that's the one image for which there's a human in the loop, so it has to be a um, sunny day in Cambridge, Massachusetts to get those. Um, and uh, the last um, image here, I don't know if we have this uh, image of the sun over time. I do. Let's go ahead and play that. So again, there's a very simple, um, there's a video tutorial for how to make these animations right on the microobservatory site. And um, uh, so I wanted to give an idea of some of the kinds of projects that kids can do. And Lindsay gave some ideas of some of the projects. Um, and I guess the last, I'm going to actually can I skip through a few slides here? Because sure. I know we're short on time, and I just wanted to um, note that uh, one thing that is um, really nice to do is compare microobservatory images to some of the space telescope images, um, because you can learn a lot in doing that as well. This, these are images of the Orion Nebula, um, which is fantastic object to take an image of and you can use uh, I know Lindsay's students use those RGB filters and took some great color images of it these two images you see here is the Hubble Space Telescope and Spitzer and then um, here's the micro observatory uh, <clears throat> taken through red green and blue filters and having those three images added together and composited again there's a video tutorial for how to do that as well here's three images taken by an infrared telescope the Spitzer Space Telescope down below is the um, Hubble Space Telescope over here is the Chandra telescope and here's micro observatory so I think it makes it more meaningful, just like that Grand Canyon, uh, when you can take your own image of that same object and really get a feel for how what incredible resolution these big telescopes have, for how big that thing is that's uh, having a picture taken of it. And um, anyway, I encourage. Uh, here's an image of a of a. Um, galaxy with a big dust lane and you can see again that microobservatory is an optical telescope so it most matches the optical um, professional telescopes another great oh, thing ahead, that Lindsay. that um, in looking at these pictures I'm imagining the the students what they would want to do is I can make one I can make an image cooler than that I can make one that's really cool and looking at, at these images, I can just imagine what they might create that in their minds they could, they really see themselves as scientists. They see themselves as artists. They see themselves as being really active in this, which I think is one of the best things about this. One of the things that Mary just showed us in those animations was uh, a sense of the dynamic nature of the universe that they're photographing. That, And when there's that sense of movement and and dynamism, there's also perhaps a sense that they might catch something that uh, in progress, something new, something different. Do you, do you sense mm -hmm. that as well? Are they also looking for a unique picture that, that nobody else has captured? Yeah, I think when uh, when we're looking at, at something like the sun, for example, they start to notice the details, like the sunspots. When they're looking for meteors, they want to create that animation. So when they're looking at things like that where they can see the change or they can see the details, they start to get really excited about how their picture is unique. As um, the, the educators in our, uh, our group today think about getting started, I know there's so many resources, and, and Stevie has been sharing links as we've gone along the way. What is the, if, for somebody who wants to get started, um, what's the minimum amount of time one would need to introduce this in the classroom? Obviously, you can extend this over, over many weeks and months and so forth. Is there a, a minimum time period to kind of just get started? 
Can you do something effective in a, in a two one-hour class periods? Well, I, I'd say yes. That's exactly what you need because um, the nice thing about the telescopes is they have a very wide dynamic range of use. Um, you can just go and take a picture and get it back, but you need two days for that because the pictures are taken at your request. And it's, you know, if you take them, if you go to the website during the day and you click for the right exposure time for the moon and the uh, uh, um, camera you want to use, uh, you have to wait till that night, the telescope will take the image and send you it the next day. Uh, Lindsay had a great strategy for um, getting kids ready for their image, which is the Micro Observatory website has an archive of all the images that were taken last night and nights before and a best of archive and all kinds of archived images so they can get used to the kinds of images that are there at the same time that they request their own for the next day. So I'd say yes, a two-day uh, plan is your is your easiest way in. One of the great things and is is any of us can go in and, and explore it on our own first before introducing a class to it. It's accessible to anybody. Yeah, I was going to add something else as well. Um, being in a museum setting, it was kind of a really cool opportunity I saw in some of our, our guests today um, who are at college level and who are everywhere from K all the way through, through college. And being at the museum where... We, where I've, I've seen kids come in who were five and six years old, who if you already have the, the software set up on the screen, they will cl start clicking the colors and like changing the, the, the brightness scale. You know, so you even that experimental level at that age, they were excited to do that. And adding more and more content as you go, you can make really make this scalable to almost any age, which I think is one of the other really cool advantages of this. And as Mary said, either you have a one-day thing where maybe you're you're working on some content and you're accessing images from the database, or that in a, in two days you can do the same thing and, and work with your own images. And, and you've given us a lot of groundwork as well for including uh, educators from multiple uh, disciplines and doing a collaborative effort. You could do a lesson on this, obviously, within a, a math setting and an art setting and a, uh, and and science and and, uh, and perhaps history as you brought up a few good historical and history of science examples, too, in here. Right, absolutely. And the Digital Quest Astrophotography Badge actually has a lot of great support for getting started using the telescope. So I definitely encourage folks to um, take a look at that and uh, try it out. And, of course, submit your, uh, um, submit your own images and earn a badge so absolutely well let me um we're going to be wrapping up in just a few moments we're happy to take a, a few last questions i would like to encourage all of you in fact invite all of you to to really click on the evaluation link that we put up we are constantly iterating and trying to improve and enhance the experience we bring to you so we hope you'll click on the evaluation link and give us some feedback about today's session so that's the first thing i wanted to mention that link is at the top left of your screen you can click on it and open it up in a new window, and then uh, as we wrap up in the next minute, you can return to it if you'd like as well. I also wanted to remind you about uh, another uh, summer astronomy event in our in our conference series, uh, and that, of course, is uh, going to be coming up on August 14th at the same time of day as we did this session, and it'll be about NASA's amazing space using Hubble Space Telescope images in the classrooms. We hope you'll join us for that. And um, as Mary mentioned, do visit smithsonianquest.org. This is a great way to have some guided exploration through all of the amazing resources you've been hearing about today. So check that out as well. All right. Um, I see a lot of people saying they can't wait to get their students in. Uh, and uh, this is exactly what I hoped would be covered. Thank you, Mary. We're glad to hear that. Um, so if you're like me, you're ready to go. If you haven't already, we saw uh, uh, many of you have not tried the Micro Observatory yet. No need to wait. Hop on in, uh, get set up, send your instructions to the telescope. We had one last question. How many tele uh, micro... Uh, um, that's a great question. There are actually five scopes that are named after famous astronomers, Annie, Ben, Cecilia, Donald, and Edward. Uh, but um, 
when you ask a telescope, we actually have several of the telescopes. There's a couple in Arizona and a couple on the, my roof in Cambridge. And um, they take different objects, uh, depending on what object you ask for. Um, and that way, we also have them repeat um, objects. So if the weather's better in Arizona, you'll get the Arizona telescope image. If the weather's better with Annie up on my roof, you get Annie's image. Very clever. That's great. Well, I want to I thank both of you, Mary and Lindsay, for, for being here today, for uh, introducing us to the amazing things one can do from the comfort of a computer. One thing we did today was meet both of you from the comfort of our computers. And uh, next up for all of us is uh, taking pictures of the sky above us all. So thank you so very much. We'll look forward to seeing everybody soon. Take care. Great. Thanks, Happy everyone. observing.